I think I'm on. Yes, I'm on. <laughs> Good. Good morning, everyone. Um, great to see you all here. And I'm here, if you don't know me, um, I think most everyone here knows me, but maybe if you're out there watching on our Zoom, and I'm supposed to stay in place, so I work for I've got to get used to this. I kind of wander around. <laughs> But anyway, I'm Pastor Barbara Engelbrecht, and I'm just so delighted to be here with you this morning. My husband Marty and I are members here of Edinburgh First United Methodist Church, and when Pastor Michelle is away, she often asks me to fill in for her, and it's such a delight because, well, I love being here in worship with all of you, and then it's wonderful to be able to uh, be here and, and to lead worship with you. It's a, a different kind of experience, and I'm just delighted to be here with you. And we wish Pastor Michelle well. She is uh, on her way. I heard that she made it to the airport this morning, so she's on her way to Sedona for a much-needed week of rest with her sister and brother-in-law. So we pray that she will have the rest that she needs and a really, really good time. Uh, I know there have been announcements that are coming up on uh, the screen, so you can see those things. Uh, things that I, I want to just point out, you will notice the little slips of paper on your seats, and there are pins there with them. Those slips of paper are designed to put down something that you remember from this week, a blessing from God that you can give a thanksgiving for. And when it is our offering time, you're invited to come forward and place your thanksgiving in the little boxes here at the front. And then also, when you came in, if uh, you noticed the table of rocks at the back, we're not building anything. Those rocks, there are pins there with them, markers, and they are designed to put something on there that you want to let go of. Am I right? I was not here last Sunday. I want to make sure I'm saying this, this correct. That you, something that God has placed on your heart that you need to just let go of, whatever that may be. And then after service, you're invited to bring them up and place them in the basket up here. And that there, we don't ask for names totally anonymous, the same way with the little thanksgivings for God's blessings. That's not important. What is is that you are given this opportunity to give thanks to God and to let go of those things in your life that may be hindering your relationship with others and with God. I think that's all I needed to say. Is there anything from the congregation that needs to be said this morning? Let us continue then with our uh, prelude.
Good morning. O Lord, I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding, and I will obey your instructions. I will put them to practice with all my heart. Guard my eyes from worthless things, and give me life through your word. Reassure me of your promise made to those who fear you. Morning. Good morning. There we go. Now we are off. Please uh, remain standing and join me in singing Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. O oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not. As Thou hast been, Thou forever wilt be. Great is Thy faithfulness, Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided, great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto. God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God, the Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, 
the ground to offer the promise of our deliverance from sin. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept for remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and health in time. We believe this faith manifests itself in the service of love, as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon us. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the first chapter. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. It is true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice. And I will continue to rejoice, for I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more faithful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when, it, and when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, today we're continuing our Lenten journey, our Lenten uh, worship and study using this this very interesting, wonderful book called Because of This, I Rejoice. And we have a study in uh, Sunday school before worship, and we have a study on Wednesday night. For those of you who are interested in the Wednesday night, this is spring break, so we're not meeting this week. But next week, we will cover chapters two and, and three. And so this week, I'm on chapter two in this book. Um, and Ashley, I should have the Sunday school class get up here. <laughs> we talked about everything I was going to say to you, so they, they know it maybe even better than I do. Thank you, Jackie, for a very wonderful discussion. Um, 
I, I love this book, and the author of it is uh, Pastor Max Vincent. And last week, Pastor Michelle focused on chapter one, and it was on joyful prayer. And it was a really wonderful message. Even though I couldn't be here with all of you, I was watching it at home. And um, if you missed it, you can go out on the web and it's out there for you to see. That's the wonderful thing about modern technology. If you miss something and it's put on the web, the live stream is there for you. And we learned last week that Paul prayed joyfully for the Philippians. But it wasn't because of anything they did, but because of who they were, his brothers and sisters in Christ. So today our focus is on a joyful witness, and we heard in our reading Paul celebrating, being joyful about the witness that he's able to give. But I want to ask you first, when you, when you think of witness for Christ, what comes to your mind? Um, like maybe the child in the book, the example that um, Pastor Max gives, that this child, um, his mother always wanted him to be good, and he heard witnesses in church about people who had had very difficult situations in their lives, and, and they, they maybe used drugs, or they robbed, or... They, uh, and they went to prison, and they had this, the beautiful witnesses about how they, that Christ came to them and their lives were turned around. Uh, and he thought, how am I ever going to be able to witness? Maybe that's what some of you think. Witnessing, you have to have this dramatic event in your life in order to change and witness for Christ. All right, does witnessing maybe... When you think of it, you come to mind of an evangelism committee. I, I grew up in, in, the, in the Lutheran church, so I know about an evangelism committee. What do you call it here in the Methodist church? Is it still called an evangelism committee team? Oh, okay. Well, when you said evangelism committee in the Lutheran church, everybody kind of stepped back. It's like, oh, yeah. That means going out and knocking on doors and telling people about our church and inviting them to come into our church because we want them to come and we want our church to grow. Uh, which is a good thing. We do want to go out and we want people to hear about the good news of, of, of Jesus and for the church to grow. But that's not what evangelism is about. It's not about having to knock on doors. And then I want to ask you, have you heard in your faith journey the word martyr? We were talking about that in Sunday, Sunday school also. It's um, martoreo in Greek. It comes from a Greek word. And we usually associate being a martyr with someone who has suffered greatly or died for the faith. Now, I'm a cradle Christian. I was born and raised, as I said, in the Lutheran church, baptized at the age of three months. I attended St. John's Elementary School for eight years. I was confirmed when I was 14, and I could say backwards and forwards Luther's small catechism. Yet, I never really understood the true meaning of evangelism and martyr until I attended seminary. And I didn't attend seminary right out of college in my 20s. I was in my 40s. So that was where it was brought to my attention that evangelism, witnessing, is, is more than, than serving on a committee or having to have this incredible story that I could get up and share with people. And have them go, wow, that is a great example how Christ worked in her life. Martyr does not mean suffering and dying. 
Evangelism comes from the Greek word euangelion, which means good news, not committee work. Good news. And the root word for martyr is martoreo, which means to bear witness. Plain and simple, to bear witness. However you bear witness, you don't have to suffer and die to bear witness to Christ. Pastor Vincent says at the beginning of this chapter that um, we're supposed to have a joyful witness. He says, remember, evangelism is about good news. It should be joyful. The news that God in Christ Jesus came for us, that God loves us unconditionally, that God's grace is for all of us, is good news. There's nothing bad in that news. This morning we hear Paul answering to the, his com little community there in Philippi because they've, they've said word to him. They're really concerned about him. They're wondering, how long is he going to be in prison? Is he going to be released a free man? Will he be executed? Or will he be locked up and forgotten? And eventually going, he's going to die in the dungeon. Well, the interesting thing is that Paul has no answer to those questions for his friends in Philippi. He has no idea what his future is going to be. But he tells them, in spite of not knowing the answer, he is joyful. Now, I don't know about you, we were talking in Sunday school about when we were young, some of us taking a group of children to a local jail. I know I went on a trip to a prison, a state prison. What's not a good place to be? Yet Paul, in his prison, which I'm sure was maybe 10 times, 100 times worse conditions than any of us have seen, he is joyful. So what's this all about? How can you be joyful when you're imprisoned? He's joyful because he has been able to share the good news. His imprisonment has helped in the spreading of the good news. That good news of God's love has come to ears and hearts and minds, places where it never would have been had he not been jailed. So in face of his uncertain future, a future completely out of his hands, Paul is joyful. His joy comes from himself being anchored in one sure thing. He's rooted himself in the promises of God. And he can say with certainty that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. That's why Paul, in prison, not knowing what the future holds, can speak of joy. It's not about where he is. Whether, rather, it's about what God in Christ can do, is doing through him. So for us, when our future is unclear, there is one thing of which we can be certain. We, too, belong to God. And wherever we are, Whatever we are doing, no matter our circumstances, we are held in the palm of God's hands, and we can witness to the good news of Jesus Christ. And you 
It's like that, that old hymn, it's, um, there is a balm in Gilead. Uh, there's, the second verse says, if you cannot preach like Peter, if you cannot pray like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus. You can say, he died for all. You can say it. God presents the opportunities, big or small. Now, you don't have to be someone like Martin Luther, who worked for a reformation of what was wrong in the Catholic Church. I think I'm losing my... Okay, just want to make sure I'm not losing my mic, that it's falling off. Uh, Or you don't have to be John Wesley, who worked to reform the Church of England. And he led revivals and brought many people to faith. Our Billy Graham in our own modern times, who, who spoke to stadiums filled with people of God's love for them. Remember, Paul tells us we are all martyrs. We are all witnesses. Witnesses to the good news. When we show love to someone, when we care for others, when we share with others, that is witnessing. Sometimes we do it in big ways, and sometimes it's simply through the actions of our day-to-day life. Let me tell you about someone that I have admired for years. I first heard her story in a movie, of all things, And the movie is based on her life and and a little book autobiography that she wrote called The Little Woman or The Virtuous One. Her name is Gladys Alward. And the movie that I saw was called The Inn of the Sixth Happiness. Alice had a deep love for Christ, and she wanted to share that love, and she felt that God had called her to witness in China, to be a missionary. Now, she was a British housemaid. This was in the early 1900s, 1920s, 1930s. But she felt a strong call to go to China, and she had little education very little educational background. And when she went to the, do her missionary studies, she didn't do well. And she was turned down by the China Inland Mission. That didn't stop her. She was joyful for sharing the word of God. She got herself to China. And she found an older woman, uh, an older English woman, whose whose dream was to have an inn where the mule drivers could stop, get a healthy meal, get a warm place, no no bed bugs and fleas, and hear the good news, stories, because the Chinese people loved stories. And that was her goal, to have a place where they could tell the stories of the Bible as these men, because they were men, the mule drivers, were having their dinner. And it did come about with some struggle and some disappointment. It wasn't easy, but it did happen. But then her mentor died, and she was there, the only English woman in this very small Chinese community with her interpreter, and she was learning the language. And there's a whole series of events that she went through, and I would recommend, the book is like, I think, 125 pages, a story well worth hearing. But she was able to witness God's love to the people who came by providing a place with no fleas, she would say, no fleas, in Chinese, I can't remember the words, and a meal and a story time for them. And then she started gathering children to her orphans because this was um, during the time when the Japanese invaded China. It was like, I think, the Second Shino-Japanese War. 
I got that right. Historians, you can tell me later if I'm wrong. But she started gathering these orphans. And then the fear of the Japanese were were coming closer to where they were. And she was so worried about the safety of these children. And she found out about a place that was over 100 miles away that she could take these children to for safety. She got them there. And that was a trial in itself. It wasn't easy. But she loved those children and she loved the Lord. And she got them to that place. Pretty amazing. She and her interpreter, many struggles along the way. And the really interesting part, if you see the movie or read the book, I'll spoil it for you, the very people who turned her down were the people that she gave the children to for safety. An English maid without much education, no great resources, And she decided she was going to do God's work. Now, that's an extraordinary story. And I know you're probably out there thinking, well, I I can't go. (laughs) I can't go to China or India or Africa. And that's true. And that's okay. Because that is a special calling from God for those ministries in far-flung places. But you can be a witness right here, right now, in our country. I remember when Marty and I lived in St. Louis, the congregation we belonged to. Uh, It was in a very um, diverse neighborhood. There were people who were quite well off, and there were people who um, were food and housing insecure. But on a Sunday morning, It didn't matter who you were walking through those doors. You were greeted with love and with a welcome and a hug. There was a lot of hugging that went on in that congregation. And it didn't matter if you were dressed in your Sunday best or if you came needing a shave, needing a haircut, your clothes were kind of rumples, and you smelled like the smoke from the fire that you had burning last night to keep you warm in the park across the street. It did not matter. We're welcome. Whoever walked through that door was welcomed and loved. And then invited to stay for a meal after worship. And it wasn't just come through the line and get a meal, go sit down and eat and go on your way. It was come through the line, get a meal, sit down and relax. And then the people who were members of the congregation would come and sit with you and share a meal with you and learn a bit about your life, if you were willing to share and share their lives, share their faith. Talk about how God was working in our lives, the members of the congregation. Here in our own city, there there are homeless people being fed 40, 40 meals, at least 40 meals, every day of the week through a program called Emily's Meals. And that was started by a seven-year-old child who said to her dad at the beginning of Lent, Dad, we've got to do something about these hungry people on our streets. We've got to feed them. And so he organized a group who decided for a Lenten journey, they would do 40 meals for 40 days. When they got to the end of the 40 days, they had made relationships with many of the people they fed. And they couldn't stop. Well, it's seven years later, and people are still being fed here in our city. It's pretty amazing. And it's not only this group that started. There are members of, well, first, we, Marty and I, are able to participate through First United Methodist. They've made it a part, a budget line in their their budget. And so every second and third Thursday, we go and we prepare a meal and we take it out. But there are members of our Savior Lutheran Church. There are Boy Scout troops. There are individuals who are restaurateurs who will call and say, hey, we had our caterers. We had a, a, an event and we've got this food left. Come and get it. People have bought barbecue lunches from some of the, you know, when the Scouts have a, a barbecue lunch and donated those 40 meals. That's another way. Right here that we witness, because when we go out, it's not 
just here's a meal. There are relationships being built. And there is a God bless you. We're so glad that you're here and that we can share this meal with you. But then it doesn't, it's not just there. I mean, think about our own congregation and our, our food pantry. When, when individuals come on that third Saturday of the month, they're not just run through the line without care. I can't imagine the individuals who work at that food pantry doing it in a very glum way. Here's your box. Marty helps. I'm sure there are smiles there. There are greetings. There are people that you know that come back month after month to know that they have some food. Now, it's not always easy, and I imagine sometimes that's challenging. I know sometimes Emily's meals is, is challenging. There were some challenging times when we did the meals and welcomed the individuals when we were in St. Louis because some of the individuals had not only insecurities, they, they also had illnesses. And so there were some interesting, trying times. And, and Paul, Paul had trying times. He was in prison. He was in chains. He didn't know what his future was. Challenges and sorrows are a part of living, and they're a part of our witness. But there's the joy. Over everything, there is the joy of knowing you've made a connection with someone. Use that opportunity that God has given you just to love someone. And you may be the only loving face they see in their day. And maybe you haven't stood there and, and quoted scripture to them. Maybe you've just said, God bless you. And they've said, well, you know, I'm going through this. And you've said, I can pray for you. Witnessing. Witnessing involves our whole life. We're not called to do these amazing, show-stopping events or go to far-flung countries. We're just called to use the gifts God has given us for loving, for sharing, and for caring. Remember, evangelism is good news. Euangelion, good news. And martyr is martareo, witness. And it should be joyful. Amen. of my day to quiet down a busy mind and find a hiding place worthy you are worthy open up my heart and let my spirit worship your Open up my mouth and let a song of praise come forth. Worthy, worthy. you are worthy. worthy. Love a 
childlike faith of my unspraised, of my unshamed love, of a holy life, of my sacrifice, of my unshamed love. Please be seated. We come now to our time of prayer. Offer our joys and our concerns to the Lord, our thanksgivings, our supplications. And we have, for those of you who are not here with us, we have at our website, and please correct me if I say this wrong, a minty link where you can go, okay, it says, what prayers do you have today for your, on your heart? And there's the link. You can put in, it's right there on the screen. Thank you. <laughs> you can tell I don't do this very often. You can use that code and put in your prayer. And again, put in your prayer. We don't know who you are, and it isn't important who you are. What is is your prayer, what you lift up to the Lord. We don't keep track of things like that. And it will be included in our prayers. And if you're here in the congregation, you're invited to say your prayers out loud. But if you choose not to, it doesn't matter. God knows the prayers of your heart. And they will go to our Lord and Savior. Whether they're spoken, put on the screen, it does not matter. So let us join together in prayer. Lord God, we come before you this morning and we do give you thanks and praise for the wonder of your love for us, for the way that you have called throughout history individuals to witness to your 
your love, some in incredible ways, like Peter and Paul, the disciples, modern times, like I think of uh, Billy Graham, I think of the reformers, Martin Luther, John Wesley, John Calvin, all who witness to your love, your love that is for everyone, for those who have written stories and poems and books, for those who have gone far flung places to share your love, Lord God, and for those who cared for their neighbor who needed a hug, needed a meal, someone on the street who just needed to hear a word of care or see a smiling face. Lord God, thank you for the calls you've given us all to be your witnesses. Help us to be brave and in whatever way we can, Lord God, to use our gifts to help others to know that incredible love for everyone. We lift before you, Lord, the concerns we have for those here in our own congregation and those in our hearts and in our minds who need your care, whether it be illness, financial circumstances, challenges with jobs or with children, with relationships. Lord God, there is so much need in the world for hope and for love. And we lift up to you, Norma and Luis, Marilyn, Jason, Don and Donna, Benny Kay, Wayne, Angie, Ray, Ed, Judy, Gary, 
give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. We come to the time in our worship now where we're invited to give our offerings to the Lord, our thanksgivings. Uh, and you may give those thanksgivings in whatever way is best for you. Bring them up, place them in the box here, and don't forget your slips of paper, your thanksgivings for the way that God has blessed you this week. You can give your monetary offerings, you can send them by mail, do it online. If you look at our website, it lists all the possibilities, all the ways that you can give to support the ministry of this congregation, to help us to share the good news, the joyful news of God's love for us. Please.
please remain standing and sing it as well with my soul. his grace upon you and give you peace. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen.